Well, I guess I, I guess I believe that any any movie that accurately presents anyone's life um, or any any situation, any movie that's not a fantasy that, that that isn't just a pure entertainment, any movie that makes an attempt to show things the way they are is to me by definition a political film. Uh, whether you've made a, a cop movie or whether it's Aaron Brockovich, you know, any movie that attempts to, to look at things in a sort of straightforward fashion and not polish it up, I think you could argue is a political film. Um, I, I, obviously, I, these are political films in the sense that there's an ideology that's being expressed and acted upon. Um, but that isn't that isn't what drew me to them, ultimately. Um, I'm obviously not a communist. I'm, I'm, there's, as I said to someone a couple of weeks ago, there isn't even a place for me in the society that Che was trying to build, literally. He says in one of his, in, in, in Man and Socialism in Cuba, he says there is no great artist who's also a great, a, a true revolutionary. He didn't have a lot of use for the kind of stuff that I do. And I think personally, he probably would have hated me. Um, but again, I can still, I can still look at him and find him, you know, one of the most compelling political figures of the last century. Um, and I do think, I do think the ideas are fascinating to debate and to look at, as you said, in the context of the world we live in now. One of the things that was interesting to me about the Cuban Revolution is that is the last time you're ever going to see a revolution like that fought. That's what I call the last analog revolution. Um, today, that would have been over in two weeks. Technology just makes it impossible to fight the revolution the way they did, as we see even seven or eight years later. That doesn't mean revolutions don't happen, I'm just saying that I don't, I don't think they're ever going to happen that way again. And that was kind of interesting to make, a, to make a, a period film about a type of war that, that can't really be fought anymore. And as far as what's going on in Cuba now, I think, I, I think the, I think that the relations between the two countries I think there was a way, I, I don't think we've been very smart in how we've played this, let's put it that way. Um, I think there are other moves that could have been made on our part to, to sort of make a dialogue more inevitable. And it's sort of, I, I'm still stunned that this is going on, that this embargo is still going on, I and mean, it's just shocking to me. Um, it, it doesn't seem to make much sense. It's my personal belief that if you, if you wanted the embargo to end and you wanted to see some change there, you should flood the place with tourists. There's nothing like exposure to, to new ideas to get people thinking about new ideas. So in fact, our policy is the opposite of what I would be doing. But, you know, as of Today I'm not running the country, but November 6th maybe, <laughs> or the 5th. What day is voting? The 4th. Fourth. Yeah, talk to me on the 5th. Yes. I don't think the economic policy that flows from Marxist and Marxist-Leninist doctrine works. I don't think it works, and that's a core principle of his belief system. So right there, you know, I, my answer is no, because I don't think you can build an economy that's going to function when you've based it on this ideology. It's an ideology that worked in a very specific place, in a very specific time, in an industrialized situation. And mostly it works on paper, because as soon as you start adding human beings to it, it falls apart. 
So, you know, do I support his idea that when a system is in place in which profit is only possible through the exploitation of the weak and the poor, I'd say, I, you know, yeah, I want to see that eradicated. But his, his methodology and, and the, the, his economic belief system, I don't think works. Uh, we had a 10-day gap between the two shoots. We shot part two first, and we shot it backwards. So it was confusing. Um, and as far as the casting goes, uh, I was, look, I was trying to stack the thing with as many well-known people as I could, frankly. So I put a lot of calls out. I think a lot of people see the movie and don't even know it's Matt, actually. Um, but I, I, I guess I wasn't really, I wasn't really worried that it would, that it would pull them out of the film because they weren't really, they were supporting characters and they weren't really supporting, you know, they didn't carry the film on their shoulders. But uh, I was absolutely looking to cast it up. I had to. Okay, and our last question. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the process of uh, choosing the location for the film and But the locations, um, well, unfortunately, as you know, we can, I'm not, as an American, I'm not allowed to shoot in Cuba. So uh, we made many trips there that were licensed through the State Department. So at least we got to look at where the events actually took place. And in Bolivia, we were able to shoot in. So part one was Mexico and Puerto Rico. In New York, obviously, and then part two was Bolivia and Spain. We shot all over Spain in some very remote areas. Um, but it turned out when we we had somebody working on the film who um, grew up in La Higuera, and when they came to the set, because we built that La Higuera set on the top of this mountain out in the middle of nowhere, and when he came to the set, he, he was stunned. He said, this is exactly what I remember growing up. He, 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 our production designer, Anton Gomez, did a, a really great job. Okay, so we have time for Steve. Thank you so much for the meeting. Thank you. Thank you.